our weekly COVID tip session. And my name is Rebecca Nevedale, and I'm with Tappy. Uh, if you, we are going to talk mainly about billing today. Um, oh, I just noticed this slide doesn't say that, but that's what we're talking about. So if your practice manager or your biller is uh, not logged on, make sure you go and grab them and tell them to. We will record this, but a lot of people think they will watch a recording, have all intentions to do it, and then it just you know stays on your to-do list for a few weeks until you decide to just stop telling yourself you're going to do it. So uh, we do start each of our, our weekly sessions just reminding you that what you're doing is saving lives. And we think it's important that you remember that every single day. We have almost 17,000 Arizona families have paid the ultimate price during the pandemic and have lost a loved one. Many of those families have lost multiple loved ones. And it's really important for uh, that we remember those individuals, especially those of us who are on the front lines, getting back to normal and helping to create herd immunity. That's it's really important for those families that their loved ones are remembered, and for our collective healing, uh, that we we know who these who these people are. So the Arizona Republic earlier this month did a a story, um, and we'll put the link in the chat to just talking about some of these people. And if you read it, it takes a really long time to read it. There's only 100 um, stories and there are 16,874 Arizonans who have died of COVID-19 uh, in the last, over the last year. We have about 838,000 cases of COVID-19. This continues to go down, which is really great news. Our hospitals have uh, plenty of capacity now, which is also, you know, really great news. And our we have administered 3,041,773 doses of COVID-19 vaccine. It's a truly remarkable feat. Um, remember, there's about 7 million people in Arizona, so we still have a ways to go. Uh, so we're gonna, we don't have much of a recap from last week because it was kind of a cut and dry topic, storage and handling. The recording is, you know, on the website. We are going to provide you with about 15 minutes that we can use all of that time or some of that time up front to get those immediate questions answered. We ask that you hold any questions about ACES, Maggie Macias from ADHS, the ACES program. She'll be able to log on towards the end of our session today and answer any of your questions specific about ACES. Jennifer Tinney will talk all about billing. Um, she will be able to answer hopefully all of your billing questions, or if not, she will be able to follow up with you afterwards too. So, um, so again, storage and handling is on our, it's on the website, um, the recording is, and we talked last week about Moderna and J&J. &J. We think that that is the product that you'll, you're most likely to get. We are hearing that we will probably start seeing a lot more Pfizer in our community. Uh, Pfizer has updated their storage and handling requirements, which makes it a little bit easier uh, to send to private providers or other providers who don't have deep, deep freezers. So. If we do start seeing Pfizer getting to our um, providers, we can do a refresher on storage and handling of Pfizer. So just let us know if, if you need more information on that. And a couple of changes that have happened this week. Uh, the big news was that Arizona has is open now to individuals 16 and up to, they're all eligible for COVID-19 vaccine. Remember only Pfizer is for age 16 and up. Uh, Moderna and J&J &J are both for ages 18 and up, uh, just because everyone is, it, it can get a vaccine doesn't mean that we can give a vaccine to everyone. We continue to have supply challenges. We, um, we hope that this will change in the next few weeks. That's what we're hearing for, uh, from the federal level that we will start seeing a lot more product and which means that we'll be getting a lot more product into your offices. But until then, just 
you know, continue to remain flexible. Um, all orders will not be approved by the counties because there's just not enough supply. Many orders, you might not get the amounts you requested or the presentation you requested. You might ask for J&J, &J, but get Moderna, for example. So it's, it's not too much has changed on the supply, even though we're open for 16 plus. And Jennifer, do you want to talk about what the new Pfizer guidelines are? Because those were published, right? Yeah, yeah, they were. They were published by the FDA, and I think we have a link to that that we'll go ahead and share. They actually changed the storage and handling just a little bit, but it's going to make it a lot easier. Um, they will now allow Pfizer to be stored for two weeks at regular freezer temps. So that'll be transport and storage for two weeks at just regular freezers. So you don't have to have the ultra cold freezers if you're gonna get vaccine and then use it right away. Um, so that should free that up a little bit as soon as we get more supply because we don't have enough to go around now, but it, it's progress. And it's still coming in the pizza boxes, right? So it's still large. It is, yeah, so large quantities. Um, and then again, it's gotta be used pretty quickly. Right. Um, and the other thing that kind of bubbled up this week, so many, even though we are now, eligibility goes down to 16 uh, for Pfizer, 18 for Moderna and J&J, &J, the counties are still trying to do focused efforts on our frontline workers. So those are people who don't have the option to work from home and have jobs that, you know, by the nature of their job, they have high exposures. You know, your grocery workers, people who work in restaurants, farm workers, manufacturing, uh, your bus drivers. So they are still doing uh, planning for those kinds of events with different providers. And they're also the counties, um, now that we're starting to get a lot more data on vaccination coverage in certain zip codes and certain communities, they are planning events in areas where uh, they're, they're under vaccinated. So if you are planning an event, and this is especially for FQHCs that many of your patients are the same people who, who were planning, the counties are planning to um, try and immunize. If you're planning an event, just let your county know about it because they might, we don't wanna plan multiple things in the same zip code while supply is so limited anyway, we need to make sure that those spots get used. So keep your counties in the loop on what you're doing. Um, just so they don't go and try and do a, this, an event for the same people, so. All right, so let's just open it up. What questions do folks have? Uh, what's front of mind? And remember that ACES stuff, we want to hear about that later. So what do you got? We had one come up on the evaluation about no-shows. How are people handling no-shows? So we heard last week that some provider offices are keeping a wait list um, of people who they who they can call and can get there within like 30 minutes. So you can call them at the end of the day. So that's one thing that people are doing. Um, and remember too, if you're doing a larger event and you have you know, volunteers checking people in and things like that, then uh, you can, at the end of their last shift, you should be, you should vaccinate those volunteers. And Kate's saying, can we ask questions about billing for Medicare and FQHCs? You can ask them now, yeah. Although we might talk about that, huh? We can kind of weigh it out. We can talk a little bit um, to your specific questions. And then if you don't let me know what your questions are ahead of time, then I can make sure to emphasize that when we get to that section too. So throw them out. All right. Well, that's okay. We don't need to have questions. <laughs> um, we have the time reserved for if you have them. So over the next week, uh, when something pops in your head that you're like, oh, I need to ask those girls about that, just write it down on a post-it note and bring it and we'll have this open for them. Um, 
So there's a couple comments coming in. So Chris is saying that they've been vaccinating their volunteers um, at the end of their last shift. And if there's extra doses that would be wasted, that's fabulous. And Leticia is saying, we had a patient scheduled yesterday for a COVID vaccine and was denied due to having a recent tetanus shot. The providers told this patient no contraindication. I did find a small blurb on the CDC website. What are the recommendations? So I think it's, you cannot get your COVID shot. And Peggy, I think Peggy's on if we need a doctor to answer that, but it's two weeks, right? Uh, you know, I was actually gonna say 10 days. So I will double check that before the end, but yeah, you, and this is not, this is any vaccine, you know, we all kind of have in mind the live attenuated vaccines can be a contraindication. Right now it's really because in the studies of the COVID vaccine, that's not one of the things that was looked at. So it's really a major precaution just to say, give some space before and after the COVID vaccine um, and hold off on other immunizations in that time period. And I double check the 10 day or two and put it in the chat. <laughs> hey guys, it's, it's Bob England, it's, it's two weeks. Thank you and Bob. And, and, it's, it, and just like you said, it's purely for the theoretical concern that you might not mount quite as good a reaction to the COVID vaccine have something else on board. Thanks, Dr. Bob. Sure. And In other words, it's not a big deal if you screw that up. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Jen, I have the experts but, on. Yep. There's a question in there about Medicare. So do you want to answer that now or are you covering that? I, I, I just saw that one come in. So that Patients uh, with a Medicare replacement and they don't have a Medicare ID, can we generate a temporary ID using the portal? Um, maybe. And I'm probably going to, we're going to go over Medicare in a little bit and the numbers. And then uh, David and Patty, I think, are on. So you may know a little bit more about that portal. I don't know if you want to jump in now on the portal or when we get to the Medicare section. It's totally up to you guys. We may have to give them a chance to. Okay, Jennifer, to this is in. David. Are you able to hear me now? I am. Okay, I evidently I had to unmute myself. So um, um, we can certainly uh, answer the question now. If the question could please be repeated though. So they are asking about that Medicare ID. So this is a patient with a Medicare replacement plan. They don't have a Medicare ID. Can they get a temporary ID using the portal for, uh, oh, that's the COVID uninsured claim portal. So that's for the uninsured. Can they do that if they don't have a Medicare ID? So um, what we're experiencing is that the Optum uninsured program will, in most cases, come back and provide the Advantage member ID number, which, you know, as we all now know, is of no value because uh, even if the patient has an Advantage plan, uh, Medicare is requiring that those claims be submitted directly to Medicare. So certainly they can try that, but it's been our experience that uh, the Optum program is providing us with the member's uh, Advantage ID number. Um, so that, that's the best I can tell you right now. Um, it's always worth a shot just to see if they will give the provider a temporary ID, but that's not been our experience. Thanks. <clears throat> so we're uh, we can launch right into our, our billing um, portion, but we're curious who have you um, billed for so far. So I'm going to launch this poll and uh, click the, the folks who you have billed for COVID-19 vaccine so far. And we know a lot of you aren't billing yet, so, uh, but please keep asking your, asking your questions. Yeah. And Rebecca, if I could just add one more thing to the whole um, 
Medicare Advantage. I, I do want to indicate that if the provider does have the patient's social security number, and if they are registered with Noridian, they can go ahead and look up the patient in the Noridian portal with the SSN date of birth and the patient's name. And if all that information matches, Noridian will come back and provide the patient's Medicare ID number. And then once the provider has that, they can go ahead and submit that claim directly to Medicare. Great. Yeah, it looks like a lot of you are already billing Medicare. So we make sure that we continue to ask the, these questions and just tell us what your, for those of you who have already started billing, um, private insurance companies for uninsured Medicaid, all of these different, these different payers, tell us throughout while Jennifer is doing her presentation, what's working and what's not, because we know that this stuff gets really like wonky. Um, so all those experiences are really, really important for people who will start billing soon. So, so I think I'm going to stop sharing and then Jennifer, you're going to start sharing your slides so you can just move forward. And just so everybody knows, like, why is the immunization coalition even presenting about billing? So back in 2008, before the H1N1 pandemic, uh, Tappy started working with the county health departments on creating a billing program. So Tappy does the billing for many of the counties for vaccines, um, HIV testing, you know, family planning services, all of the different kinds of services that 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 our counties provide. And they these services are provided to uninsured individuals, um, Medicare and Medicaid eligible, and also to privately insured folks. So we really do a lot of help with private offices and FQHCs on billing challenges because Happy has a whole team who that's all they do is bill for vaccines. So, and Jen, I don't know if there's anything else you wanna say about, about what Tappy does with billing or what you can help, but, but jump right in, whatever you yeah. want to run your show. We primarily bill again for the county health departments. We really started off just looking at the policies of billing. We had no intention of being a billing uh, program, but it was so complex, as you guys know firsthand, that um, for the county health departments, especially because they had grants and they had other things that might um, bump up against that, we ended up actually billing the claims in addition to doing the policy side. So we do policy and then we do some of the claims for the counties. It's a little bit different from the private side. So we rely on you all to share with each other what's working best. Um, and, and then I'm also gonna call out, you already heard David talk and Patty. Patty and David run the billing program uh, for the county health departments. They end up doing a ton of research on policy for billing. And then they, they move through a ton of claims for vaccines. So they are experts on that side, so they can jump in, but then share with each other what's working as well. Because again, the private side billing is very different from public health. Um, but we'll go ahead and walk through some of the billing issues that we've seen and some of the policies that have come up just to kind of get a framework so everybody knows where we're starting from. So the good news is we've got a couple of executive orders on the federal side and on the, on the state side that are really gonna help with this. Um, the biggest change, I think, that's the best news, well, there's two best news now um, that compete with each other, but as of the 15th of this month, the administration fee that you can bill now is $40 per dose. So if some of you have been doing these clinics for a little bit, you know that originally it was a little over 16 and 28 for the first and second dose. Now both doses, one or two, are $40 um on the national level and locally so that's going to make a big difference for you guys who are doing these clinics because they're hard to do the other good news is that these are considered in network regardless of who you're contracted with so it doesn't matter if you don't have a contract with um, maybe you don't typically do medicare or you don't typically see access patients you can bill for those now under the open network executive order um, so some of the other highlights are Medicare Part B roster billing. We'll go into that a little bit more. Medicaid is following the CMS guidelines, which means they're going to do the $40. Um, they're also doing some of the in-network 
pieces as well, so you don't have to be contracted with all the access health plans. And then we'll talk about the uninsured program, and then we'll talk about no patient out of pocket and what that means. And then um, there's also a link here, and I think we're going to put a link in the chat for the billing guide that has all of the registration links that you need for all the different agencies. So first, this is the CARES Act Provider Relief Fund. So this is this, this pot of money that has been put into Medicare, into Medicaid, and to uninsured in order to reimburse you all for the work that you do. So the money was, was put in for vaccines given in 2020 and 2021. They may have to go back and redo this act later on. But what this means is that providers can get reimbursement from private insurance plans, Medicare, Medicaid, and for uninsured uh, recipients. You may not seek reimbursement, including balance billing for the vaccine recipient. So that's the good news, bad news. The good news is there's a lot of funding out there to help pay for this. The bad news is that you have to go through these really cumbersome systems in order to get the $40 admin fee, and you can't bill the patient um, no matter how many barriers you run into when it comes to billing. So you can't charge an office fee um, if they're just coming in for a COVID-19 vaccine. Um, if you are seeing them as part of your routine care, whether it's well or well or sick visits, then you can bill for the vaccine as well. But if they're just coming in for a vaccine, you can't do an office visit on top of that. Um, and then you can't require that they come in for those additional services either. If they just want a vaccine, you have to just give them the vaccine and just bill for the vaccine. So this is the CMS policy. You know, I wanted to make sure that it was written out here for you, but essentially what it means is current Medicare providers um, who are a traditional Medicare provider will now be considered a mass immunizer and can bill for the shot. New Medicare providers can do a fast track enrollment They'll enroll you within um, 24 to 48 hours to make sure that you can bill as a mass immunizer to Medicare, even if you've never billed Medicare before. So these mass immunization clinics, there are some specific sections in here that really talk about doing those mass clinics at churches, community events, um, shopping malls out in the community. You can bill for those as a mass immunizer in an off-site location. So that's come up a few times because I know licensing issues, there have been concerns about hospitals doing uh, clinics outside of the hospital grounds and being able to bill for it. You can, and you don't have to have additional licensing for that. So you just bill as um, a place of service offsite. Um, Medicare Part B billing change, this is where it gets sticky. You don't bill the Advantage plan. You submit the claims directly to Medicare um, as a, on roster billing as a mass immunizer. So you don't use their Advantage plan. And this is the part that has been so hard for everyone, for all the providers and the, and the patients as well. Patients are used to providing their Advantage plan number first. They are not accustomed to providing their Medicare ID number. So we do have a little um, section of language that came from Medicare to the patients that we can provide. I'll follow up with that. I don't have it today. Um, that will, you know, you can hang it in your clinics. You can post it on your website, telling people why they have to share their Medicare ID number because these patients, you know, I mean, they know their their benefits and they kind of get, you know, a little pushy about it, saying, "No, you're always supposed to build my Advantage plan." So this will give you the language to talk about this time for this vaccine, we'll be billing your Medicare ID number. Now, and as some of the dialogue that went back and forth, using that social security number, if they don't have their Medicare ID number and they don't know it, you can get their social security number from them. And again, use the language that's coming from Medicare to talk about that so that they know that you're not, you know, it's not some kind of strange thing. Um, this is getting very, very difficult. And I think most of you who, who have been billing Medicare know how difficult this is. So, um, Jen, we had a question. Did you guys have a couple of questions come in on the chat that are kind of related to this. One is if the patient doesn't want to give their social security number or their Medicare ID, can they bill the Optum uninsured, COVID uninsured instead? So, and, and Patty and David may have a little bit more information about this because now they've been testing it, but the way the Optum system, you know, 
says is that you're supposed to build these other plans first. Then you can submit it to Optum if they're uninsured. Optum sometimes will give you back the patients that are insured. They'll give you back that information. And David, do you want to talk about that or Patty, what you guys have been seeing when you submit a patient that you don't have the Medicare ID number? What happens when you try to submit it to Optum? Yes, uh, this is David. Um, so what we have found is if we have a Medicare patient that has traditional Medicare and is not part of a Advantage plan, if we submit that to the Optum Uninsured Program, they actually have been processing it and giving us a temporary ID number. And the reason for that is we've been told that they themselves, the Optum Program, they also don't have access to Noridian to be able to uh, provide us with the, the patient's Medicare ID number. So as a result, they have been giving us a temporary ID that we could then use to submit a claim to Optum for reimbursement. So that's kind of the advantage if we have a patient that has traditional Medicare and doesn't have an Advantage plan. Because as I indicated earlier, if they have an Advantage plan, it seems like more oftentimes than not, Optum is providing us with the Advantage member ID number. Great. So I get so, so a, you're going in circles a little. Yes, yeah. I, I mean, again, it, the best case scenario, if if we can't get the SSN or the Medicare ID number, the best case scenario is to have a patient that has traditional Medicare because it seems like Optum is willing to provide us with that temporary ID because they too don't have access to the Medicare system to to provide us with that Medicare ID number. Great. And then another question is around Advantage plans. Should the vaccine and admin fee be removed from the claim if the patient has a face-to-face -face visit and create a separate claim just for the vaccine only? You're talking no. about it. Go ahead. Oh, I, was, I, I think that's for, a, if they're in for a well visit or a sick visit and you give them the vaccine, you can bill it on the same claim with a modifier, is that correct? David, do you know? Um, you know, I'm not sure about that. Um, Patty, are, are you on the line and do you have more information on that? All right, um, this is Patty. Um, We've not been billing any COVID claims as a part of another visit, so we don't have experience with that. We've been doing the mass pod setups for the county, so I don't really know, but I would think you can put a modifier on the claim and have it go through. I do remember something to that effect. Yeah, so maybe one of the, especially the FQHCs who are doing it in the office can chat in what your experience is, so. Um, sorry, Jen, I'm just trying to get them while you're on that subject so that if we have follow-up questions that we can, they can speak up. And everyone, feel free to just unmute yourself and ask your questions too. You can interrupt her. Oh yeah, feel free. So this so is- So typically with, I was just gonna say, typically with you know kids, this comes up all the time because they're always in the office for a well visit or a sick visit. You can give a vaccine, bill for both of those, and you put a modifier on it. And I'm assuming that COVID is going to operate the same way. Does anybody have any other? Well, but it's on the Medicare Advantage plans, and we're not supposed to bill Medicare Advantage for the COVID. Right. Yes. For Medicare, you're going to have to do two separate um, claims, one to the Advantage plan, and then the vaccine directly to Medicare. This is Patty and I'd like to add a few more tips. And um, so as you all know, if you have a social security number, you can go to the Noridian Medicare portal and look up the Medicare um, uh, benefits identification number for the patient. Um, the other thing is that UHC Advantage Plans appears to be providing that information on their portal. You can get the MBI for the patient um, if you know their Advantage Plan number. 
I believe if you call Humana, you may get a representative who won't help you, but if you're lucky enough, and we sometimes call back many times, they will look up as many Medicare Advantage plan patients that they have. And as long as you give the number, they'll give you their MBI. So um, there, there are some helpful things out there, but there are a whole bunch of plans that won't give you the patient's MBI. The other challenging thing about the, getting the MBI from the patients is that the MBI is recently changed. And so the patients have their old MBI and not their new MBI. So um, it certainly is challenging and we're finding in a lot of situations that we are um, not going to end up getting reimbursed for those Advantage plan patients because we can't get a temporary ID number for them from the uninsured program because they give us back the Advantage plan policy information. And we were supposed to build that, but of course we can't. Yeah. One, one other side note um, to other uh, portals that are, are of help. Um, if a patient has United Healthcare dual um, eligibility, um, that would suggest that they have a Medicare slash commercial uh, product, the United Healthcare, but it also means that they have access eligibility through one of the access plans. So what you can do is you could look up that patient on the access portal. And once you're on that portal, if you go to the tab that says Medicare benefits, if the patient truly has Medicare benefits, if you click on that tab, it will provide you with the patient's Medicare ID number. So that's another avenue that you can pursue to obtain the patient's Medicare ID number. Needless to say, this is not easy. And it's, you know, nothing like changing the way that we do it, you know, halfway through and then all the other complicators. So, you know, the, to kind of follow up and, and close out Medicare, I hope, um, these are the groups that are already considered a Medicare um, supplier that doesn't have to re-enroll as a mass immunizer versus the other side are provider types that don't typically do vaccines, um, but they can enroll with Medicare as a mass immunizer. And these, there are some unusual groups here, um, labs and a durable equipment suppliers, groups like that. So make sure that you enroll with Medicare if you've not done Medicare before so that you can start billing for any of those claims that come in. So then on to the ever complex uninsured patients and the programs for that. So again, remember you can't bill the patient anything out of pocket at all. So you, if you have an uninsured patient or if you have one that the claim was denied, you can't follow up with the patient. You can't balance bill and you can't get any fees from the patient directly. So for uninsured patients, you submit to the HRSA program, which is being managed on the Optum platform. And that's how you, um, you get that reimbursement back. You have to attest that this patient, that you've at least asked this patient if they have um, insurance, and then you can submit those claims. But you have to submit first to get a temporary patient ID number, go back to your claim, put the patient ID number on the claim, and then submit it. Um, they ask for a driver's license number or a social security number. So again, I mean, this is something maybe we can just make some signs for every office if they'll be helpful that explain Medicare and the uninsured and why they're asking for these numbers. Um, if that's helpful, we'll go ahead and do that because this Optum system is kind of difficult. But they do, in many cases, give you back information to say, hey, we did find some um, insurance information for this patient, and they'll give you those numbers if they have them. So these are the two links for access, the FAQs regarding billing for COVID-19 vaccines, and then there's a CMS toolkit. Um, this thing is updating daily, so check them frequently, keep both of these up as long as you can, and then they'll churn through some of these problems that you all are having and that we're having um, and a lot of times they're changing their policy kind of day by day because they're finding these problems. So continue to check those as you go. So these, I'm gonna go through these really quickly. Um, these are just examples of each one of the vaccines with all of the NDC numbers that are listed on them, um, the 
the codes for billing the admin for each of these vaccines. So there's Pfizer, there's Moderna, there's um, Janssen. And then I went ahead and put AstraZeneca in. It has not been approved yet, but it should be the next one that's coming. I think they're gonna be submitting to the FDA here shortly. So just so you have those codes ahead of time. We also have it here in this, in this chart that helps you follow the um, CPT codes that you use for the vaccine, which have a $0 cost, and then the codes for the um, administration fee for dose one and dose two. All of these codes are different. So each vaccine has its own code, each administration one or two for each particular vaccine. So they're vaccine specific and dose specific. Um, if you have shots that you gave prior to 315, you have a different billing rate after March 15th, you can bill that $40 rate and that, that will certainly help. So on these slides are all the codes for Pfizer, Moderna, J&J, &J, and again, AstraZeneca, just so you can get ready for it because it's coming next. Some of the things to look for in these potential changes in workflow for federal vaccines um, I, you, you'll notice on the previous slides, I highlighted the box NDC code because the way that the CDC and McKesson and ACES and, and all of the public health departments track the number of doses is by the NDC code on the box, not on the vial. Most places are used to using the NDC code on the vial. They're used to scanning it and putting it in, but you've got to use the box in order to make sure that the inventory gets reported to ACES correctly. So I, some of you last week talked about United Healthcare denied the claims because it was the, the NDC on the box versus the vial. Are you still having those problems? And uh, David, have you run into any of those on ours? We have not had um, any denials for um, NDC. Uh, we have been billing with the NDC that's on the carton, so uh, we haven't had any issues in any of our practice management systems that we work from. Okay, we did let um, Access know because I think it was the United Healthcare um, Access Plan, so we did let them know they're going to follow up um, and make sure that the plans realize that we're going to be billing with that NDC carton number, not the vial number. So document the record as a federally supplied um, vaccine for inventory reconciliation. This is for most of you who are already connected to ACES. You're used to doing that for VFC. I'll go through a little bit later what that looks like. Um, you bill that admin fee um, to insurance or to HRSA. The vaccine, you bill zero. Um, and then again, you can bill 16, 28, or 40, depending on the date of service and the dose given. Um, bill under the physician or global standing orders. I'm going to apologize for my dogs in the background who are very excited. There's a deer in the yard. Um, so they're going to let everybody know that, you know, we're under attack from a cute little fuzzy Bambi. Um, but anyway, so if you're billing, bill under the physician or the global standing orders. The global standing orders is one that's in a hospital or a bigger system. They have a global standing order or your physician standing order. Use a place of service code 60 if you're an off-site immunization clinic. So that's, this is what this is going to look like when you get it out on that claim. Um, you've got the vaccine that you bill for zero or one penny, depending on uh, the payer. You're going to have to check with them. Um, and then you bill the CPT code for the administration of the vaccine and the cost related to that. You do a place of service code 60 if you're off-site. And then your rendering provider is your base of operations. So if you typically work in a hospital or a clinic, but now you're doing it at the fairgrounds, you would put your rendering provider as the, the, uh, your medical director of that clinic um, that you typically work out of. So location code of 60, make sure you have standing orders in place that are written by the provider um, from the base of operation. And then you're billing the vaccine for zero and the administration for now 40, yay. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of, you know, the overview of billing. Next, I'm gonna talk a little bit about reporting because billing and reporting begin to overlap because of the information that you collect. But so are there, do we wanna take some questions now on billing? And you maybe had a, 
Did you have a poll, Rebecca, or was that yeah, that's later? Not, or a little bit later, yeah. Does anybody have any additional questions on billing before we start getting to how it relates to your reporting? All right, let's talk about reporting. Okay, so uh, and this, you know, we went through this a little bit last week or maybe the week prior, but again, the CDC lets ADHS know the number of doses for the entire state of Arizona. ADHS divides those doses by the county population and then gives those allocated numbers to the counties. The counties then look at the list of providers that are in their counties and, and then try to figure out how they're gonna divvy up not enough vaccine to get out to those providers. Um, from there, ACES links those doses into ACES into your provider account um, once your county has kind of given the go ahead for that allocation. Um, you accept those doses in ACES and then they start to be shipped to you um, through the CDC distributors. And then once you administer those providers, you report the patient record to ACES, and then the vaccine inventory is adjusted. So every time you give a vaccine, it gets reported to ACES and it takes down your inventory by one more dose. That way, ADHS, CDC, and the counties can look at any time and say, you know, this person has used most of their doses, we need to get them some more. Um, you build the health plan, and then ADHS runs a doses administered report, sends it to the county and the CDC, and then everyone knows exactly how much vaccine is in the state and how much is being used. So for these vaccines, uh, you report them to ACES with the patient record, and then again, that adjusts your inventory within ACES. You also have to report just the number of doses given per day to Vaccine Finder, You'll get an email survey from ADHS asking how many doses that you gave that day and how many are coming up. And then from your local health department, you will have a process for how you report those doses. And because this is, you know, it's all happening on that federal level with a lot of money involved and a lot of people watching, everyone in the world wants to hear from you daily on the number of doses that you have. So it is quite a bit. This gets confusing with the FQHCs and the allocations because they get um, vaccine from the state and they get vaccine from the federal side. So um, this is gonna get a little tricky for them, I think. These are the federal report reporting requirements, patient level data that has to be reported with every dose within 24 hours. This is from the CDC. So uh, some of these are provided by the patient during registration. Some of these are generated by ACES or your EHR and automatically populate, but um, this is exactly what you need to report each time you give a vaccine. So any, any questions about how that reporting happens and where that takes place? And do any of the FQHCs, are any of you on and have had, do you have any experience yet with what it looks like to report federal versus state, and is that crossing over at all? When you say federal versus state, what do you mean? So some of the um, community health centers have been getting an allocation directly from the CDC that just started, and um, each, each week they're adding more community health centers, which get that direct allocation from the CDC. They may also be getting them as an allocation from our state doses. So you guys kind of have two different reporting uh, mechanisms, I understand. Well, that's the, that's the struggle um, for us because we got it from Maricopa County. And that's what I'm not sure if that if that's what you mean state-wise, because we got it, we got our doses yeah. of Moderna from the county. Yep, that's state. So um, okay. it, it goes oh. from ADHS down to the county and then over right. or over from the CDC directly. Right. So we for our Maricopa County, um, we were about a month and a half, about six weeks in before they figured out for eClinical Works how we needed to have our lots identified. And so for our Maricopa County um, provided 
uh, stock, we had to choose public vaccine stock. Okay, but um, in the chat, I'm I'm putting in like what we have available to for our lots. Okay, those are our choices, and so we have government supplied non VFC. We use that for our VFA stock, so we can't use that, right? And so then we have government supplied VFC, that's for our VFC. And we have private. So how they've directed us to do the federal direct supplied is to use private. So that's how we have it set up. Okay, good. That's what I that's what was you know, that was hanging out there. So we weren't sure because if you clicked that it was federally supplied it was going to go over to ACES and decrement your Maricopa County doses, even if you had gotten it from the CDC. So I'm glad that they clarified that. So um, in FQHCs, if you get a dose directly from the CDC, it's, you log that as private purchase. And if you get one from your county or state health department, you log that one as PAN. Um, and here, I'm going to show you guys how. So you have private purchase vaccine, you have vaccines for children, you have vaccines for adults, and now you have PAN for COVID, you know, COVID vaccines. So you can see these are the designations that happen within your EHR that talk to ACES directly. That's for those of you all who are, who are signed up with HL7 interface so that your EHR talks to ACES and you don't have to data enter it into the web. So these are the vaccine codes that you use. For PAN, you're going to use VXC50 that says this is a public vaccine. This is for COVID. Um, just a hint why you guys are upgrading and updating your EHRs. If you're getting 317 or VFA doses, like many of you did last year for those supplemental flu doses that came through, you use this um, C52 designation. So here are some examples of what that looks like for eClinical Works, when you go into this dropdown to select VFC eligible, you're gonna need eClinical Works to send you an update that includes those PAN codes as well, so that you can click on that directly to get that reported. This is what it looks like in NextGen. So typically you would um, choose that there, if the vaccine that you're giving is a non-VFC or a VFC, you need another button that says PAN for COVID. Um, this one is for EPIC. When you go in here and, and choose your eligibility status, make sure that you have an option for PAN. Um, this is all scripts. You have private, public, and uninsured or something kind of small, undefined. You've got to make sure that you've got a little bubble there for PAN. And then this one is for Athena. Again, funding source on your dropdown, make sure it's got PAN included in that. And then CERNA is very similar to Athena's as well. So what do we do so I, if we don't have that PAN option? Um, call your EHR vendor. Uh, they're okay. supposed, according to the CDC and on the CDC's website, all the EHR vendors have said, yep, we've updated all the codes um, to include uh, COVID vaccine. That's all the CPT codes plus the funding designations. But at, each time, you implement an EHR at your site, it becomes a little, you know, a little bit more um, specific to that site. So you might have to call your EHR vendor to say, how do we activate these new codes? How do we make sure that we've got these funding source choices? Hi, this is uh, this is Tam. Um, to add to similar setup we have here at Mountain Park as um, Chris was just reporting. We also have eClinical Works and how it was explained to us was there won't be a pan selection in that drop down that it is somehow coded on the back end. So when we select it, when it goes into ACES, that's how they're able to distinguish between what is the pan based on how the lot is entered. So we don't have an option where it says pandemic, but on the back end with that non VFC eligible somehow with ACES, the communication, when they get it, it does have that PAN designation. So you're saying that it should have PAN in this dropdown, which that's not what we have. Correct. 
So and that may be one of the ways that clinical works has decided to set that up, which is a smart way to do it, is if they're looking for all of those codes, whether it's by your CPT code or by a lot number, or the NDC, eClinical on the back end may be kind of turning through that and saying, okay, automatically attach that um, one CVX code on here to make sure that it gets decremented as PAN. Have you tried it? Is it working? So far, yes. I just wanted to um, clarify that we shouldn't actually see, based on the CDC recommendations, pandemic in the dropdown within our EHR. Okay, that's good. And, and I think it's gonna be different for every, every single EHR. Um, so if you're doing it by manual data entry, make sure that you pull down the funding source within the ACES to, to click PAN. And then find out, um, you know, do a couple of tests and see to make sure that it's decremented inventory and find out how your EHR um, vendor decided to approach it. Some, I think, did that back end code so that every one of those um, COVID and NDCs automatically did it. Others didn't because they didn't know if at some point um, this was going to be a federally supplied vaccine and a private purchase so that you would have to make the designation with each patient. So I think it's gonna depend on how your EHR decided to handle it right now. So, you know, contact them and find out and do some test, test runs. Thank you. Jen, we had a couple, uh, we, question, yeah. a couple questions that came in on the chat. Denials from access plans using an SL modifier. Are you seeing that? We're seeing SL modifier. So th this is yeah. David for for the COVID vaccine. It would not require an SL modifier. All right. For the access plans, they're not requiring it. There are a couple of private plans that were in the beginning, but they may have changed that. Have you seen anything back from the private plans, David? No, we actually haven't. And um, every claim that's gone out, whether commercial or access or Medicare, um, we are not submitting it with an SL modifier. And we haven't had any claim denials um, for any payer that, you know, potentially would require it. We've not seen any denials. So my recommendation would be for those access claims, really for any claim, I would not submit it with an SL modifier. Thank you. And then You're there welcome. was another question around rock, roster billing versus electronic. Um, what issues are people seeing? What are the common denials and ease of correction of rosters? David, have you had any denials back and corrections yet? So uh, were uh, the questions referring to Medicare claims? Yes. Roster we are billing. not. Yeah, we are not doing any roster billing. We are submitting all of our Medicare claims electronically. Now, to submit claims electronically, the provider must be enrolled to with the clearinghouse and Medicare to submit claims electronically. So that's like an extra step where, generally speaking, most payers don't require any type of special enrollment to submit ele electronic claims, but Medicare slash Noridian, they are a payer that does require special enrollment to submit claims electronically. Okay. Yes, so this is Patty. Normally when you're registering for the first time with Noridian slash Medicare, um, and if you're registering as a mass immunizer because you've never been registered with them before, they're going to assume that you're submitting a roster, um, but you can also uh, register for EDI setup, which means you submit regular claims. And that's what we set up for, so we don't have experience with submitting rosters for um, COVID immunization billing to Noridian slash Medicare. Thanks. Yeah, I want to make sure that we we have about six minutes left and Maggie is on the line too. So I wonder if we can open it up to just, you know, whatever questions, including ACES things that you have. But we do want to remind, I know we mentioned the ACES user group last week, right, Jen, on this? Yeah, 
Yeah, we mentioned it briefly. It just kind of came together a little informally. A lot of um, you all new to reporting federal doses were kind of looking for some tips and tricks. And we have a lot of expert ACES users who have been doing this with the VSC program for a long time. So we're going to have an informal meeting next Tuesday from 12 to 1 just to kind of meet each other and see if, you know, we can either form some groups or try to solve some of these problems that you guys are having and see what the commonalities between the EHRs are. Very informal, just to kind of help each other, um, you know, muddle through this with all the policy changes day to day, it's hard to keep track of. Thanks, and we'll make sure to email that link out too. So, but what other questions do you have about billing or ACES or anything else? We did have one, Maggie, thanks for signing on. We had one ACES question pop up already. Is NextGen or um, CIPHER, is that Cipher, Cipher? I don't know how to say it. Uh, do those integrate with ACES? Um, I'm familiar with NextGen. As long as you, they can produce a 2.51 um, HL7 message and they can meet the criteria, um, I shouldn't see any issue. They can always email our ACES group one email and we can start off there by sending the initial form, initial interest form, and we can determine if they are compatible with ACES. Thanks. How do I get my EHR integrated? I submitted the application and haven't received anything back for weeks. If you can make sure you're sending it to ACES group one email and you can put attention to Maggie and I will go and look at that email. All right. Any other questions? I, I stopped sharing my screen, Rebecca, so I can go okay. in here and get some of those links posted Good. for um, Maggie and ACES. In Cerner, we have public non-VFC. Is that what we use? And I think they're talking about for the, um, because their EHR doesn't have a PAN designation. I guess it would be. I mean, it's it sound, has anybody else is anybody else already billing through Cerner? Because we heard in eClinical Works that that's working that public non VFC option. So anyone else have Cerner? Is it working? Well, looks like you're the one who's going to test it. <laughs> and let us know next week. Um, we were curious how many of you had EHRs that, if you know your EHR does not have that PAN designation, can you write uh, the name of your EHR in the um, in the chat because that that is going to be helpful. Maybe tell us, but it's working anyway. You know that the claims go through anyway and it decrements anyway or not. We will, that'll be helpful for us as we start helping more provider offices moving forward. Any other questions or things? Yeah, billing is not the sexiest topic. No. You know, it's really not as fun as most of the others, but yeah. <laughs> unfortunately it's complex on top of it. Yeah. All right, well, next week we are actually going to talk about providing COVID vaccine in the office setting. Um, so Amy from Mountain Park is gonna talk a little bit about their experiences so far. Uh, which we're really excited about. And then we're going to try and see if we can get another private office who's not an FQHC who has been getting vaccine uh, to talk a little bit too. So if you are a private office and you want to, you know, it's nothing fancy that you need to prepare, but just be able to show up at, uh, on our call next Thursday and talk about what's working, what's not, how do you schedule patients, how many no-shows, you know, do you 
do you find, um, you know, blocking off just shot only visits is working or do you just offer them in your regular visits? Just let us know if you're able to share some of those experiences. So. Uh, we are, we'll keep the line open for just a couple minutes, just in case anybody else wants to chat in things, but otherwise, thank you all for what you're doing, and we will see you next Thursday uh, at noon. Thank you, guys. It looks like most of them, Jen, coming in on the chat don't have a PAN designation. No, I, it, it, you know, and we'll probably have to try to clarify that because there are two different public non-VSC codes. One is 317 and one is PAN. Yeah. So. Well, yeah, and if they're paying through 317, Well, 317 would be yeah. VFA. Right. And it and just won't decrement the PAN or the COVID one. Mm -hmm. Maggie, do you have any insight on how that's working? What you it guys has, are seeing? Um, what I'm seeing when they're selecting the, the public non VFC, as long as the CVX code is accurate, it's coming over and decrementing properly. So that's on the back end for their But EHR. that's on the back they're end of, yeah. The so they end. wouldn't be able yeah. to know. As long as on the front end, they're selecting the non-public, then their EHR vendor probably set it up in the back where that indicates, you know, the, the CBX code. But we're seeing it decrement. Yeah, and most of the um, EHRs did say that they, you know, they were going to have the code set up the right way. So hopefully they did it on the back end. So it's easier for for these groups and you know the clinics that are using it, and they just have to select that it was a publicly funded vaccine. Correct. All right. Well, I think we're all pretty quiet, so it's probably, I think we're good to sign off. So we will see Thank you all you guys. Thank you.